Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third and final In the Spirit Artist Spotlight with Dan Friday. We're thrilled to have you here with us tonight. I want to start by first acknowledging that the Washington State Historical Society is located on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations, and we pay respect to their elders, both past and present. So I want to start off with a brief explanation of In the Spirit, both In the Spirit Contemporary Native Arts and the Northwest Native Festival. This is our 15th annual exhibition and festival, which is looking quite a bit different than how it has in the past. Um, this year, while we are collaborating with our same partners that we've started working with the last few years, we have brought on a much larger advisory committee who helped guide us in the process of going virtual, both with the exhibition as well as with the Native Festival. So you can see, you can visit inthespiritarts.org to see the entire virtual exhibition featuring 20 contemporary Native artists and their works. Um, also, I wanna put in a plug, you can vote for the People's Choice Award winner. Once you visit that site, click on the button that says, see the exhibition and it will take you to the virtual exhibition on the washingtonhistory.org website. Um, and you can vote for your own favorite work there. And we award both first and second place people's choice. Um, this program is actually part of the In the Spirit Northwest Native Festival, as well as a virtual arts market. So when you go to inthespiritarts.org, you will also see that there's a tab for vendors. You can go on there and shop with all of our incredible native vendors. And then you are also privy to see all of these incredible events that are hosted by each of our partners. So we're thrilled to be partnered with Tacoma Art Museum as well as Museum of Glass, who also were doing online programming, which you can learn about at inthespiritarts.org. I would also like to thank our entire advisory committee, as well as the jurors who made the selections for this year's exhibition, as well as selected the award winners. And I would also like to thank the sponsors. In the Spirit Virtual Arts Market and Northwest Native Festival is generously supported in part by Arts Fund, Arts Wa, the Hobb Family Endowment, Humanities Washington, the Northcliffe Foundation, South Sound Magazine, Tacoma Arts Commission, and Tacoma Creates. So thank you to our sponsors for making this virtual experience possible. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, please feel free to visit washingtonhistory.org to learn more about how you can become a member or how you can support through donations all of this virtual programming and experiences like in the Spirit Virtual Arts Market and Northwest Native Festival. So tonight we are joined by Dan Friday. I'm going to invite Dan to join us. Let's make the video. Hello. Hello. Hey. Here you are, and I'll stop share so that we can see each other a little bit more clearly. But welcome, Dan. And I'm going to go ahead and give people kind of an idea of your background with your bio. So Dan Friday is a member of the Lemmy Nation and a Seattle-based glass artist. He has spent the last 25 years working for artists like Dale Chihuly, Paul Marioni, Preston Singletary, and many others. Um, Dan's themes and images are drawn from his Coast Salish heritage and are solidified in the world of glass art. He has taught at the University of Washington, Hillchuck Glass School, and the Haystack Craft Center. Dan has had residencies at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, so our neighbors, the Burke Museum in Seattle, the Corning Museum in New York, the Dream Community in Taipei, Taiwan, and Dan is a recipient of the Bill Holm Grant and the Discovery Fellowship through the Southwestern Association for Indian Arts. His work can be seen in Blue Rain Gallery, which is in Santa Fe, Stonington Gallery in Seattle, Ainsley Gallery in Toronto, Habitat in West Palm, Florida, Chance in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and in many collections around the world, including the Washington State Historical Society's permanent collection, which we'll talk about that work soon. Dan, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Absolutely, thanks Molly. And as always, we have the amazing Len, our program facilitator, who is on Facebook, and she will be fielding questions. So as you have questions for Dan, um, go ahead and put them in the chat. And then as we have our conversation tonight, we'll also make sure those questions get posed to him as we talk about all of his work. So just wanted to make sure that we have our audience participation. 
So thank you again, Dan. Um, let's start with where where are you located right now? Uh, I'm in Shoreline, Washington, but Seattle. Yeah, more or less right there on the, the border of the two cities. And how long have you been in Shoreline? About three years. My studio was in Fremont for about 15 years and I've uh, mostly lived in, in North Seattle area, uh, but I recently bought a house and moved out of, you know, I did the thing where you live in your studio for living the colorful artist life and <laughs> now we're in the sink and eat microwave food for about 10 years. I did that and uh, just recently bought a house and with my wife and children and live in Shoreline and trying, trying out some new digs. Did the microwave come too, or? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, I did, Fremont is great because there's so much good food. Uh, the PCC was right across the street from my studio and they have a great like food bar. And I I guess not ironically, that's where I met my wife is that she worked at the co-op there, so. That's amazing, I had no idea. That's incredible. Yeah. So let's talk about when and how did you become an artist? Uh, you know, I like to say that I've always been an artist. I feel like a lot of times you, especially in the academic world, you're kind of looking per, for permission or kudos, you know, like you're anointed from on high to create work. Uh, and kids are always creative. Not all kids are necessarily creative, but I think that that, that curiosity and that creativity, uh, you know, not that it's stamped out, but it can be just redirected in, in other things. And, you know, uh, I've always been somebody that worked with my hands. I went to art school and there's a school and went to alternative school growing up, one called University Heights in uh, University District in Seattle. And from there, I got a scholarship to go to uh, the Northwest School, which is a large, it's a very small school, but it's a pretty heavy hitter in the arts community in Seattle. And it just never really seemed you know, as a teenager, I wanted to eat and wear clothes. So I got a job as a mechanic and worked on cars because I was interested in that. And it just being an artist as a career just never seemed feasible. And until uh, I kind of walked into a glass shop one day and I'm like, well, I can work with my hands and not work on cars. And so I'd like to say I've always been an artist, but I think finding our voice is something artists we all kind of go back and forth with what is a rational decision or uh you know grateful that i don't have you know a, a long college debt chasing me around yeah that must be that must be a good feeling <laughs> not having that college debt kind of weighing you down yeah but it, it's, it's like I said, and that's a great place, I think, for artists to make work. I, I totally support that. Like I said, I've worked at the University of Washington and I think that's a great way for people who aren't exposed to arts in the same way as some people are. And I feel really fortunate. My uh, I come from a long line of artists in my family and uh, my aunt Fran, uh, Fran James is a really prolific uh, Coast Salish blanket uh weaver and basket weaver and she really kind of said you know it's like i feel i mean it's intimidating you know especially in the fine art world or the glass world or the gallery like how do you go and showcase yourself or where do you get the chutzpah to like kind of storm into a gallery and like represent me and you know how do you get seen i mean i think there's a lot more tools to do that now and than there were when i was getting started but it again fran uh james was really instrumental she's like you know you don't need people's permission to make your work and you know this you need to find a path you know because i've made a living making other artists work for quite a while and i still work for a lot of or not as many but i work for a pretty successful artist making his work and i'm grateful to have that to, to pay the bills and to stay in the industry but I largely support myself with my work now. And uh, it's something I would have never thought. It just didn't seem really practical when I was going out on my own and out of high school. And where do I, how do I feed myself? So it's, it's kind of been a long road, but like you said, 
earlier, I've been doing it for about 25 years now and I'm highly unemployable <laughs> if it was anything else, so. I love that. Well, and you bring up a really interesting point about, um, you know, making glass art is actually, it's quite a bit different from making other types, styles of artwork. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up a video and maybe you can talk a little bit about how, what you mean when you say you're helping somebody else make their art and vice versa. Absolutely. Pull this up so that people can kind of see what it is that we're talking about. Yeah. So it looks like you have an entire, there you are, but then you're surrounded. <laughs> I've got a team of, of uh, guys and gals helping me, definitely. Um, yeah, glass is unique. I mean, one of the things that I'd say first drew me to it is you can see the flame behind me and it's, it's so tactile and it's, you know, again, working with your hands and I've always had a sketchbook and stuff, but I, I think what's so dynamic about glass making is, is the team work. Um, I wouldn't say it's a collaboration because you definitely come in with there's one person that's a designer, but I, there's no way I can make this work by myself. I need uh, a team of people to help me. Um, you can see here, this is the start of a basket. Those are all small canes, but you got Taylor heating it up. We do have somebody videoing. My good friend Greg Owen is uh, getting ready to hand me the broom and help me roll this, this fused panel up. And it's just an extra set of hands. You can see Manuel Castro in the back is kind of getting ready for the next step. And so I'd say the best analogy for working with glass, although you're not producing something physical or tangible is being in a band because there's, you can't make the music all by yourself. I mean, now you can with instruments, but you know, there's just all these personalities that you have to navigate and any one of us at any point can break this piece that we're working on. So we're really, you put a large group, I mean, you put a large amount of faith in the group and uh, you really, it's like a choreography. And, you know, one of those things that you don't see when you're dancing with somebody is like, well, I'm also trying not to step on your toes. And, uh, you know, there's, there's this rhythm that, you know, especially you develop you know, like Taylor, who you saw in the last, he's around here somewhere in this video, but he, somebody I'd worked with for about 10 years and you develop a rapport that, I mean, you could put two virtuoso glass artists together. And if they haven't worked together, they just don't, they're not in harmony, you know? And uh, like I said, it's, you know, we're no Beatles, but it's, it really takes, uh, takes some time to, to get dialed in to be able to uh, create work together. So have you done a lot of these different tasks that you're kind of describing? Like, have you worked as each of these other people for a different artist? Uh, yes, absolutely. And that's, again, why I don't, um, I'd say art school is a great way to find your, your vision or work on your voice and come out of this thing with a resume or a bio and I mean, I guess maybe not a bio, but to have like a mission statement more or less, but the cool thing about glass, again, I'll use the music analogy again, is it weeds out, like you can't read a book about how to play guitar. You know, there's just hours you have to put in the 10,000 hours, Malcolm Gladwell sort of thing. And you just, you can't, you can't fake experience. And so you literally need to just break a lot of glass to where you get proficient enough to do it. And, um, yeah, you, the apprenticeship, it's one of these things that really has a, you know, there's no, you can't pay your way to the front of the bus or a class or whatever. You literally have to put in the hours of, you know, I've done everything as sweep floors. And, you know, that's where I started. I was a mechanic uh, when I first started in the glass shop. So I worked in the fabrication and the equipment area because it, it was easy for me to kind of do that transition. But a lot of you start as an apprentice and you know, you literally just have to learn the terminology. Um, 
a lot of times when you start blowing glass, it can take about four or five years before you even start making things you're even remotely proud of. I mean, there's a lot of milestones along the way, but as an artistic medium, it's, uh, I mean, I, like I said, again, any, anything that you need to build up that sort of skill base to produce something with, ooh, it, it's hot. <laughs> I haven't seen this video in a while. My friend Derek Klein made it. He's got a great, uh, he's a great videographer. And uh, I need to, turns out I need to do some more of this. This is from definitely about four or five years ago. This is a fern basket. You can see the pattern on there is a Twana style, Coast Salish uh, fern pattern. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things that there's no substitute for uh, paying your dues, and I like that about it. It really um, is such an intricate dance. I can't imagine, like you're saying, all the hours that go into understanding the whole process, kind of being allowed access to the point where you can then kind of like learn all of these things and get your hands on all of these materials. But one thing that's kind of interesting is you just said this, this specifically, you're creating a glass basket, which that's not the materiality we're used to seeing in terms of like Salish basketry. So like, do you, do you have a big background in understanding that type of art that then allows you to translate it into this new media? Um, it's, I'm sorry, my screen is doing something. Uh, you know, and it's just something I'm passionate about. And so I look, I look for that. And I think, you know, everybody's work is different. Um, like, again, it took me a while to get the skill set to, to do that. I do really enjoy uh, exploring these, these native imagery, you know, you know, so many like my, so my zoom screen is up. I don't know if I'm being recorded. I'm just going to keep talking. But the we can see you, so you're at least set there. <laughs> yeah, I can't really see the video, it just says Zoom, but so many native artifacts return to the earth, you know, just by the process of their material. Um, you know, the, the wooden things, my great grandfather's totem poles, there's literally one left out of, you know, a lifetime of carving totem poles. Um, these native artifacts and the artworks of native people, uh, you know, there's, Museums are the large, largest house of these, you know, these really, the, the older ones too, especially. And so being able to make this work in glass is something I really am enamored with. When I study at Corning to go and see an Egyptian head that's 4,500 years old and it looks like it was made yesterday, it really is such a, a fascinating material that way. And, uh, yeah, so yeah, again, making these baskets. These are things that I have researched at the Burke Museum and there's, uh, you know, within my family, uh, but also, you know, there's plenty of books about it and it feels really good to kind of preserve some of those images. The, the name of the show I'm working on, my next show at uh, the Museum of Northwest Art is called Future Artifacts. And uh, I'm working with a bunch of blanket weavers and. Uh, just kind of exploring, uh, exploring contemporary native art and just these new voices in Coast Salish traditional uh, practices and forums, but also just made in the modern era where we all have my Instagram account, you know, sort of thing. And we're all aware of uh, the modern world and each other here. That's such an interesting way to think about it. I hadn't really thought about those materials kind of like returning to the earth and then how long and lasting glass is. Um, we just did an exhibition not too long ago at the Washington State History Museum that was focused on all of the glass materials that we have um, in our collection. And we kind of tend to think about glass as a really delicate medium, but it can be created into something that's really strong and durable. It's the strongest. It's stronger than steel in some regards. It just has no tensile. It's really brittle, you know? Your smartphone screen, there you go, you're back. I see, I see. Um, you talk to someone again. <laughs> yeah, um, the, yeah, that's what's so great. It's such a great material. 
And, uh, you know, just off on a little side note, uh, native artists, uh, you know, there's a lot of press around contemporary glass and native art. I'd say some of the first glass native art is the beadwork, you know, and that was it. And what a valuable commodity the glass was. I think that's overlooked or that whole thing as a category is underrepresented or not represented at all. And I, uh, I'm sure someone else has thought about it, but in, in my mind, it just like, oh, why, why is this not, you know, documented as glasswork? Because that mosaic and any of these other things from, from Mesopotamia are all registered as glasswork. And these, these beading and these patterns and these color themes, which are, you know, you go buy a pair of native beaded earrings at the Mexican restaurant in Santa Fe and you're like, wow, these are great, but this is, this is their legacy. And it was part of the, like the trade, you know, that aesthetic that, that they just took to right away. And, you know, they had the history of glass in America was one for bottles, but largely to produce these beads to use as currency in the plains as their, uh, the Western civilization is coming in contact with these, you know, the trade routes with through Native American country. And so that's, that 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 initial contact has created some of the first class native artists i think um I'm sure there's some scholar who has technically a technicality in there for me somewhere but uh, i really like what a lot of the the new beaters are doing with the work is, is really cool there's and, some really beautiful works with all of that glass beading it's just so impressive yeah angela swedberg is one and jay akuma there's a bunch of i couldn't I'm gonna choke on somebody's name right now. So I, but there, there are a lot of people doing it and I think that's really cool. So incredible. Um, so we were watching a video of you creating that basket that clearly had like a lot of different pieces that were going into it. It seemed like something that was really intricate to kind of conceptualize and then create. We had a question um, from the audience what's the most complicated piece you've designed? And is there any correlation between the technically challenging and how much you personally like or relate to a piece? Well, one of the things as a glass maker, you never get it. You almost as a rule of thumb, do not like a piece until it's like finished being cold worked or shipped. And it, it can break at so many points, you know, even if it comes out of the oven. Uh, I mean, and it's almost like the curse of like, that was the best one. It's like the best one always breaks, you know, just to keep you hungry. Like if it wasn't difficult, I wouldn't be entertained. Like it keeps you coming back like a moth to the flame. You're like, I have no money. It costs so much to do. I must do more of it. It's like a bad drug habit. It is, uh, and you mentioned earlier, uh, and I, I, don't know that I brushed over it, but having access to the material, that's one of the things that is so tricky, um, you know, and, and it adds this pressure to it because it's not one of these, like, I'm just going to casually go into my studio and put on my music and drink the tea I want and walk away for a minute and take a phone call. It's like, I've got to get those four guys. I'm like, we've got to agree, like, okay, I'm going to pay you to show up at this day. You got to be there at seven o'clock or it's, you know, like the whole, there's such a, it, it's such a, it was, you know, because I'm a really independent person as it is anyway, but to make work in this style where I've got to be conscious of three or four other people on the team and how that, I mean, it just adds up not to mention if I'm funding it. Cause when you're beginning, a lot of times you'll just trade time with other artists but it adds this immense level of pressure when I'm spending $2,500 for an eight hour day to create something that could break. And so when people see the price tag on glass, they're like, what the, and I'm like, it's literally as cheap as I can make it without giving it to you. You know, and, uh, it's so such a weird material that way. Um, the best piece I've made, technically the totems are really tricky you know, there's so much prep work and that basket that you saw, that's a lot of prep work too. Um, and so when one of those breaks, when I'm making it, it's like, I have a little death inside, but I have to move on 
because it's it makes me you know the morning process has become quicker it never doesn't hurt but i've got to move on to the next thing and you you just can't you've got to cover ground so that basket it probably took me three or four hours of just setting the mosaic up uh and then probably four hours of pulling all the cane so the cane so well, i'll just call it a mosaic but it's it's technically cane work but the way i lay it in lay it down on that ceramic shelf is a, is a lot like a mosaic but that pattern just setting that up takes hours and uh and that's time you don't get back when it breaks so it, it just you're it just you're just that much more vested in whatever it is you're making so you're, you're definitely playing for keeps at that point and you're like hey could you guys not be hung over today or not too hung over or can you guys like you know when you come in at 7 30 i start to lose my mind and there's all these managerial things that come in and working on a team like that and it's hard to separate yourself from from the money or the time you have invested in it but that's also the that big a risk or that big a gamble makes the reward that much sweeter when something comes together and you guys are all high-fiving and you've just like come to this precipice together as a group so it, it has that's the things that people don't see. They see the glass work, but what I'm also really in love with is the process and the 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 way it's made and the community. Um, because I think naturally my inclination as an artist is to just like lock myself in my room and just not show it to anybody or just do it. At my, you don't have to argue with anybody about how anything's done or and like I said, not that we argue when we're making, but I take input from everybody on the team and, you know, we go back and forth. And like you, like I said earlier, you can't, uh, you can't fake that rapport that you have with someone you've worked for with, with or for, for 10, 25 years that, uh, you know, you can't, you can't just establish that overnight. I can't even imagine the amount of communication it must take in order to describe what your vision is talk about like create the choreography basically with the team to then get the input and then actually make it a reality it just seems like incredible it makes so much sense now that big price tag on those works yeah well and you i mean i think one of the things is I, like I, again i've learned how to communicate so much better just that's one of the byproducts of, of working like this with other people is like no, I need to explain it like they don't know what I see because, you know, you often don't know what someone's perspective is and then being honest. There's so many things in in our modern culture where we like little white lie or we dance around these, you know, it's like just being blunt, you know, just little things that like seem like real big common sense. But, you know, they have a lot, you know, that those are just little life lessons that, have, like I said, I, I feel really grateful that's again one of the things i love about the process absolutely well you mentioned um fran james um kind of helped you along the way in this process of becoming an artist um is there anybody else who's inspired you um you've talked about um it's kind of like being in a band sometimes are there musical inspirations do you play music too um are there other artists that have really inspired you i i, I low-key have musician envy because i just feel like oh, there's so there's such rock star there's a great what was it how does it go what's it huh oh there's a there's a great glass blower joke about being a rock star uh uh i'm choke i choked on it but whatever the uh yeah it has uh yeah like i said musician me i really love music it's one of the art forms i could not go without like it was like i definitely don't want to be blind but i could not look at any of the miles and miles of uh you know calendar art or whatever it is you know what i mean like there's there's as much art and content out there as uh you know and, and music is one of those ones that can so dramatically change my mood instantly it's like okay yes this gets me in the zone or like it can take me to that place again after all these years and uh and i know art, physical art is just different uh than that you know a lot of times it has a message or a meaning and uh 
it just, I feel like it goes into a different place in, in me. Um, artists that I am inspired by, um, I mean, a lot of glass artists, Paul Marioni was another in the glass world, another person that just kind of gave me that like nod, like, look, you just do it. You don't, you know, you, I feel like a lot of times you're looking for like, is this where I get in or that, you know, it, you don't have to, I don't know, how do I sound? You kind of just have to take it, you know, you have to just kind of go and like, I'm just going to do this, whether it works or not, or I, it's a like a blind faith sort of thing or a leap of faith. Like you just really like, I'm just, uh, I'm committed to it, to do it. And it, it takes a lot of encouragement to get to, to that. Um, Alphonse Mucha is one of my favorite artists, not an artist. Uh, he's a Czech artist and largely known for his, uh, he's like the father of Art Nouveau and really uh, was largely known as like a poster artist or an illustrator. But uh, he's he's done so much other. He's worked in glass and is a designer mostly in jewelry and metalworks. And but somebody who just had a beautiful aesthetic that kind of carried through all the different mediums that he worked in. And yeah, you, I mean, you're probably familiar. He does like the job cigarette paper or the shot noir. Like I did a lot of opera and symphony posters in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I think the way other artists work, you know, just that dedication and seeing that. And again, in my family, Fran James, my great grandfather, Joseph Hilaire, his, uh, you know, he's not somebody who was alive when I was, but I grew up knowing of his story. And uh, he was just somebody that kind of went against the grain a little bit and kind of going to do it my way sort of thing. And naysayers he had a, the ability to turn off that switch or you know this modern era of trolls and not read the comments or whatever and just kind of blaze on without you know feel like you need to, to do that to march to your own drum absolutely i love that we need more role models like that that can kind of demonstrate like let it roll off and like you keep doing what you need to do i love that you have that in your family yeah I, yeah, I feel fortunate too. I'm grateful. Well, I'd love to talk about your work that's in this year's exhibition. I'm going to pull up this work. So you are the Honoring Innovation Award winner this year for Forager Tote. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and you had mentioned that the totems can be really intricate. So I'm curious, um, what was the process for creating this piece? And then also what's the inspiration behind it? So this piece, let me see, one, two, I guess we'll just count the basket as one piece, but it's really made up of about like 40 or yeah, 40 or 50 little pieces. Um, much, it's like a miniature version of a large basket. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's seven different individual pieces. But so like the raven on the top is sculpted separately on another day. And I think what's unique about the way that I kind of, you know, I didn't definitely invent it, but it's kind of unique. And most of the sculpted glass you will see is blown. Um, I do it solid because I really like the lens. It's also a little more durable somehow, or it can be, it, it, it is really sturdy, but it, the little parts, you, you could still break it. it. They still break, but it's uh, surprisingly heavy. But what I do is I, it, they have a really subtle color. And so there's a thin veil of color on each of these pieces. And so everything in this, except for the basket uh, on the lap of the bear uh, is solid. And the color application technique is kind of unique because I blow a cup and then I fill this cup with solid glass and then start to sculpt it. And then I do these pieces individually and stick them all together hot. And again, it's one of those coordination things where I've got a huge team of people. Um, I've got the works from two or three days preparing all the different color cups and 
the different parts and and just getting the size the proportions right that's one of the things like that i've learned um a bear with a small head does not look good but a bear with a larger slightly larger head is uh will pass but a bear with a shrunken head looks really silly to anybody so um yeah this is a really nice one uh the color that like i said i, I definitely didn't uh come up with the process but i've really I definitely refined it for my process and i really uh like the the subtle colors they're kind of something you have to see in person to kind of really grasp it and i also tell people that you cannot uh you can't over light glass and that's why sunlight is is so good you know and i spend quite a bit of money on uh photography that's something that i've learned from my mentors dale being one of them is uh you know more people will ever see a picture of your work and i guess if you're a young artist like if you're gonna blow some extra money it seems like well hey i have a camera i'll just do it i'm like pay 175 bucks let someone else take a picture of it and uh because again more people will ever see this especially in this day and age i mean that whole industry just went up right being able to photograph your work and work with a friend of mine ian lewis he does uh some of my photography more recently um and he actually adds video so i'll take a a a, 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 a still like this you know on a, a lit lit table or whatever the lighting is they do but he'll also do like a turntable video which is a great way to see these three-dimensional works a little more three-dimensionally you know uh just gives more information uh but yeah what goes into making this it, there's a lot of preparation and then it probably takes about six hours to assemble all the parts and that's kind of the hairy part where you could you know there's no going back um any point along the way you could break it um i had a bunch of them break in the oven <laughs> it was a had a rough year 2020 already uh we had an oven failure sort of thing or uncalibrated uh, oven and a bunch of them broke and that's one of those things where I just literally like show up in the morning and like, oh, I just lost thousands of dollars. Awesome. But you got to keep rolling because um, life goes on and you're, you know, that's you're not being helpful if you're feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, this piece is about mushroom hunting. I often, uh, when I get lost out there in the woods, I follow the raven. You can see there's a raven on the top, a morel uh, mushroom, and then there's a salmon. The bear is holding that's kind of uh i put that in a lot of the pieces uh that's a and then there's a small what's called reticello uh basket it really looks like this woven pattern but it's really a, a really it's got a long history of a venetian technique uh in the basket it's something you probably can't see in this picture but yeah this is a really nice one or one that i'm really happy with i should say so uh yeah are you a big uh, mycologist? Um, do you like to go mushroom foraging? Absolutely, yes. That's the way, you know, and what better way to get out in the woods and feel like, you know, I'm definitely a urban person. I grew up in the city and spent a lot of time. And I think that that balance, though, that's where I look for that balance to be connected with uh, not just the old ways, just the current situation is, you know, the the woods is it's a great way to center yourself. It's really honest. It's really, you know, there's no agenda. You're just out there as the, you know, you're out there walking in space on this thing, spinning through it. Um, so, it, and I really feel like I'm where I need to be when I'm out there. So those are some of my, you know, and I, I draw a lot of my themes from nature and that sort of thing. And so I feel really at home, like a lot of people, and a lot of artists, you know, I, uh, and mushroom hunting is one of my favorite pastimes. What a great way to cover ground and have like an objective. It really like works to that like predator finder brain to like, oh, I found, wow, I'm playing a game out here and how many did I get? And, and they're great to eat. I love eating. We have to do that every day almost, right? And so. I love morels. They aren't the easiest to find, but we're coming up on, you know, big chanterelle season. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited 
Love that. I think it's our, yeah, it should be here, right? Just been working so much. I, I don't have quite the as, as much free time as I used to have, but yeah, that is if I could be somewhere that's it's definitely in my future after the next this next two week run. Well, the rain is here. So the positive thing is we get all of those incredible mushrooms. So yeah. So you had mentioned you came in and there was the oven incident where a number of the pieces were broken. Someone was curious, how often do things break? Like what's the percentage of broken items versus like to full completion? I'm gonna knock on wood that you can't see right now, but I'm pretty good. So not that often. So it was a surprise, but I've been doing this for 25 years. I know when things are gonna break, but things break in shipping, things break uh, in the cold chop. Let me see this year. So if those three totems broke and then two bears, I've lost five pieces already this year. And that's quite a bit of money. I mean, I won't go into how much money that is that I, and it's not even the money that it was gonna potentially be. It's the money that I've already spent doing it. And like, I almost am blissfully ignorant. I just kind of like, I can't hear you. It's over there, blah, blah, blah. I don't even want to know how much I just lost. Uh, and that, so I guess that's pretty bad, but I'd say for five and I've probably made 50 or 60 pieces this year. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, I have two shows up right now. So I've just created a bunch of work and they don't, it doesn't always go smoothly. I, yeah, it happens a lot less. I mean, I, I'm really familiar with my process now, but I'm also starting a new series of work and I anticipate, I'm like, again, knocking on wood, hopefully it goes really well, but the reality is you've got to break some eggs to make an omelet. And so as I'm going down this road of uh, R&D and, and figuring out these new designs, I. I'd be silly to think that I'm not going to break some or it's not going to turn out how I want. Um, but if I'm just banging out the hits, it's like, you know, like being in the band, it's like a, it's such an easy analogy. I fall back on you kind of bang out the hits. I, I know what I, I know what the tolerances are, but yeah, yeah. I'd say at least five pieces this year and some big ones. These totems are big, you know, they cost me a lot to make and uh, time and I'm vested and, Oh, they were so nice too. And then to see them just sitting there broken, I'm like, I almost don't want to throw them away, but it's like sitting there looking at them is almost worse. <laughs> so. So how large is this totem? This totem is 29 inches. Yeah, just a little over two feet, um, but it's really heavy um, it, because it's solid. And then keeping it straight and hot and solid is a trick. It's a real dance. So you've got to keep the pipe turning. So if you imagine that that's like, it's on a lathe, like the pipe that we use is like the rod that we heat, heat, reheat the glass and shape it on. It lives on what we call a punty or a blow pipe, but it's got to be turning. It's got to be hot enough that it can move. And if I stop turning, like if you gather honey out of a, like on a mandrel out of a, a honey jar, you have to keep the little mandrel turning. And as soon as you stop, the honey runs off the mandrel. Well, the same thing is with this. So when we're sitting here assembling this piece, somebody by hand has to keep it turning for six hours, whether it's me or one of the assistants or, so that it's, it's such a dance. And uh, if it gets fickle or finicky or it gets off center, it doesn't turn as easily. Um, I mean, again, that's probably probably about 40 pounds of glass, uh, which doesn't sound like a whole lot. Like if you, but just pick something up that's 40 pounds and then hold on to it for six hours. And then, uh, then we'll talk about it because <laughs> it, it gets real heavy after, uh, it's, it's an endurance thing too. You know, you really have to be tempered to the heat because the, the heat is so hot and uh, we're working with it the boss's son has been hanging out with us at work today and I just forget how hard it is. Like I just, somebody that's that new and working, I mean, the heat is one of those, the biggest things to overcome because, you know, as I'm like leaning over it, like, um, I mean, anybody that cooks in the kitchen or has worked in the kitchen as a 
chef or at some in a restaurant in a professional setting just standing next to an oven all day it's like it's a different level of fatigue you know so you're saying you have biceps and forearms of steel and <laughs> you can take you can handle the heat yeah just without sounding so yeah corny. yes yeah you know uh calluses that's one of those things it's a low-key party trick. I don't need oven mitts. I can just kind of pretty much grab things out of the oven. I'm like, hey, you know, sweat. But uh, no, I, I burn myself when I'm cooking more often than not because I don't respect the kitchen at home. And I'm like, I got, ah! And that's when I really burn, burn myself. Um, I love hearing that. That is just so awesome to me because the how hot is that like how hot is it in the glory hole when you're actually like putting glass in there versus 2400 like, 2400 degrees 23 22 in that range over 2000 degrees so 2000 to 2500 degrees so about five times as hot as your stove so it's like i'm like oh i handle this super duper hot all day there's no problem i can grab those tater tots ah dude I'm going down from this little oven. <laughs> Don't let anybody know. And the, the, the worst part is, I mean, because you do burn yourself in the glass shop. The worst. It's like inevitably you burn yourself first thing in the morning and you have to work burnt. And it's like then your little tootsies or your little whatever you get burned is like it's so sensitive to the heat. Every time you get close, it's like, ow, 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 ow. And, it just makes for a long day. It always happens like first thing in the morning when you haven't had enough coffee or whatever the story is. So how often do you injure yourself? Like, and have there been any major injuries? Knock on wood again. I mean, I've had some pretty gnarly burns. Uh, I think at 25 years, you know, I haven't, I've had two hernia surgeries cause it's heavy lifting. Um, and then you can blow your joints out. My joints are on the, it's hard on your back. I mean, like I'm 45 year old dude. Uh, and so all this comes with like, you know, I played football and rode bikes and was a boy and there's all what, you know, nobody gets out of life alive. You know, you just, it's just part of it. You get your bumps and bruises. And the repetitive injury, like turning a pipe for eight hours straight, you know, like just having, just wearing, turning your joints to powder, you know, kind of it's, I don't like to think about that out loud, but it just, I have something in my hands for eight hours a day when I'm working. Um, and it, but it also, you know, it kind of tempers you to it, you get used to it. But yeah, I'd say burns are one of the more severe ones. Um, falling in the shop is bad. I personally have not taken a, a big spill knock on wood uh but i know of people that have you know everything we work with is metal and hot and uh and if you get the unique glass shop situation where you get the cutty burny so you get cut by something that's molten hot and it burns you at the same time and cauterizes it that's a unique glass shop injury it's like it burned me and cut me at the same time what the f <laughs> But it doesn't bleed as much, I guess. Uh, Always looking on the bright side, yes. <laughs> well, let's talk about the other work that you have in this year's In the Spirit exhibition. This one is called Owl Totem. And maybe you can describe um, what this work is about, the inspiration behind it, and the size and process. Um, yeah, so the process is similar. It's larger. I'd say this is also about 40 pounds it's not larger uh, height wise, but in mass, it's it's really solid. Again, I this is kind of a, I wouldn't say signature, but these the technique of how I color glass is different than most sculpted glass. And so I really kind of work on getting that rainbow pattern. And it's one of those things where the way I mix the colors in the base, uh, I don't always have control. I mean, there's some alchemy to it. I mean, it literally is the metal oxides in the color that allow glass to have color. And it's just like low key chemistry. Sometimes it doesn't work the way I want. And 
sometimes it does like this one i'm really pretty happy with the color and that's the kind of the, the line i walk like a, a lot of times i don't know until the piece comes out of the oven the next day it's like did it do the thing it was going to do or it's like did my bread rise or did it you know did it did it work um i mean i have an idea but it's not it's not written in stone um yeah the owl totems owl that's one of the first things i made um you know after talking with my aunt fran and uh just kind of getting that uh just having that determination to really focus on my own work and i mean i'd say that 20 that was probably 12 12 years ago um you know after i'd been blowing glass for about 12 years so it wasn't like i didn't and i had made other stuff but really just kind of taking my career seriously i mean it, it happened also when i got sober i've been sober for 11 plus years and that whole timing, I mean, it's no coincidence that those two things overlap. Um, taking yourself seriously, uh, focusing and kind of who am I, what am I doing sort of thing. But the owl, uh, I had been making owls this whole week. So I probably made seven or eight owls and I had an owl come stay in my cabin with me and uh, it had been hit by a car and uh, was, it wasn't dead it was knocked out and the wildlife rescue was closed on the weekend i couldn't get a hold of them and so it ended up staying with me and uh then one day it flew up to the window and i'm like well if you can fly it's time to go and i can't always read the writing on the wall but i am like well i think that's a sign to keep making owls and so these are some of the first pieces that i i started making that is such an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, I guess afterwards I found out it was a it's a barred owl. And uh, when I spoke to the wildlife owl expert, she's like, yeah, you're lucky it didn't claw your face off while you were sleeping. This was literally a one room cabin. And it, I made a little nest for it. And she's like, yeah, they're super vicious. I guess they're the ones that attack joggers quite a bit, the, uh, the barred owls. But uh, yeah i think maybe it took pity on me because i helped it helped it out a little bit but it was uh yeah it was one of those things like i said I, it gave me that that feeling and so i've they've kind of evolved a bit but this one i made earlier this year and is like one one this is the culmination of there's lots of bad colored ones out there for me to get to this one that's saying i really like i love this and it's it's too bad that we can't see these in person right now that we did have to go virtual for the exhibition because like you said, it's just so unique to get to see see these works in person, I'm sure, having seen your works from last year's exhibition and getting that 360 view and the lighting. So hopefully we can see these in person eventually. Yeah, well, I hope so too. Well, and Speaking of that, Full Circle Totem was in the in the Spirit Contemporary Native Arts exhibition last year in 2019, and it did win the People's Choice Award first place. Um, and I remember receiving your application and getting to see the image of it. It's a totally different experience to see it in person. I mean, seeing it that size and seeing it completed, just the intricacy is amazing. And so, yeah, that one is about four feet tall. And uh, I'm sure from the picture, you're like, that could be nine inches, right? You almost have no point of reference until you see. And a lot of glass is made on that scale. That's a, a pretty big one. I've scaled them down a little bit. Um, yeah, the full circle totem. That's one of the first totems, you know, and I was really trying to figure out. Uh, my totems and uh uh you know again like so my great grandfather joseph hilaire and his you know the coast salish history of the storyboard or house post or uh you know he was really uh i mean it wasn't a maverick but i guess he was unique in his approach to making his totem poles at the time in the late 1800s and just uh you know at the time he would rough his out and with a chainsaw 
and that was like almost blasphemous to like how you know how do you do it like you know that is that that's not our process and you know he cut a lot of flack for that and uh and i understandable you know i understand i'm a i love the tradition too bro you know uh, i love people to do everything tr you know traditional and but he's like well like chainsaw just makes sense to my process too and he the way he would paint them and um now it's common practice everyone uses a chainsaw to rough up the totem pole duh uh but it was again he was uh ahead of his time ahead of his he was a, he was a unique he marched to his own drum uh he actually um he's he's buried at Suquamish, but he lived the last half of his life in Quinault. Um, and again, he was, you know, the polls, there's a great book that my aunt Pauline Hilaire helped write uh, called The History of a Coast Salish Totem Carver, uh, Joseph Hilaire. And it, I was, it, I'm grateful to have that, to be able to read that, you know, to, to help carry on that. And I was trying to find my own way. And, you know, I'm using this material that again, this piece is, fragile to a degree but even in pieces it will still be here millennia and i i always like that uh, that that idea that that brings me joy um you know like and pre-contact we talked about the glass beads of uh, beaters earlier i mean it wasn't until there were metal blades you know people were carving these things with a jadeite and shell and uh beaver teeth and uh you know the totem poles that they saw in the 1600s didn't look anything, you know, 14, you know, like what are the first pre-contact ones look like? They they evolved with the advent of, of metal blades. Um, so it just is a natural, you know, progression. And again, native people are so, so, so resourceful. You know, the jingle dress being made with like tobacco lids or whatever, whatever materials are available are, are fair game for artwork. And so I, um, that's the way I lean anyway. And I, um, yeah, I, I enjoy making these out of glass. Well, and before we move on to this other piece, I wonder, I would like to share this video that just kind of gives a sense of, um, how you create the, the totem specifically. So let me pull up that video. And it's just a really quick video to give people a sense of how you go about that process. I know I sent you this video, but I'm trying to remember which one of it is in my head. I'm like, uh, yeah, okay, this one. Yeah, Reticello basket. Yeah, in fact, making the totem that you have the image of. So I've got Kevlar gloves on. And again, you can't see all the people there, but there's quite a bit of people on these teams. Oh no, it's not the same one, but it's very similar. Yeah, Taylor and we're getting ready, kind of sculpt in the Raven. And they're all assembled really hot, all these pieces are made, not all of them, but most of them are made ahead of time and assembled at the end there. So we've got one, two, three, Doug Burgess. Uh, I don't know if any of the people watching, uh, Nancy Burgess is a really famous Haida basket weaver. Her son is, I wouldn't say an apprentice of mine, but he's a guy that, one of the young bucks on the team. And that was made at the Museum of Glass there. And uh, I, again, I owe them a big gratitude of, a debt of gratitude is they've helped me out in my career quite a bit. I uh, begin again because glass is one of those things that has a high cost of entry and is really tricky to get access to. And if, if it wasn't for places like the Museum of Glass uh, for access to the material or the Burke Museum for access to content and uh, you know the museums, I, I'm grateful. And there's many things that I I uh, you know and I understand. You know, I know it's a hot topic these days, the repatriation of things, and I think there's definitely a place for that where it is needed. But I'm also very grateful that places like the Burke Museum 
house things that would otherwise have not been cared for in a way. Um, and if they're in somebody in the family's closet that's fighting with the other half of the family and no one has access to it and it's getting destroyed, um, which a lot of things are, um, at the Burke Museum, they had this great uh, toolbox of my great great grandfather, Hetelak Osiem, uh, had to see his personal effects with his handwritten, with his name written in his hand. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it was just really special. And so again, all the, all the museums that have been involved, like, and your guys included, have, have, I'm just really grateful that they give, you guys give people a platform. There's, you know, a, my work wouldn't be where it is today without uh, help from a lot of the museums. And I think finally museums are at the point where they're figuring out how to serve all of these different audiences too. So yeah. hopefully going beyond that, obviously repatriation is very important and like making sure that all of these items are cared for respectfully or in the appropriate hands. But places like the Burke have gone out of their way to create opportunities, have mentorship opportunities, learn from collections. And that's a great thing. Well, and when things are collected responsibly or, you know, they just, you know, a lot of times they're betrothed to the museum or, you know, kind of that sort of thing. And who knows about the questionable means of some things and some things are, I mean, we all, it, it just serves the greater public. I think that we all need that. There's you know, again, as the tribal members, I have to the open at door and relationship with the museums that I am really grateful for. And I know we're we're in a learning process. We're in a constant learning process as a museum. So um, I had mentioned at the beginning of the program, we're so grateful for the advisory committee for In the Spirit and the jurors that we get to work with because things like the Purchase Prize Award, you know, we're we're considering like what is going to be going in our permanent collection and um, how are we going to be good stewards? Which actually brings me, <laughs> that was a nice little segue into the final piece of yours that we were going to talk about, which is Cedar Star Basket, um, which was the 2019 In the Spirit Purchase Prize Award winner, meaning we purchased that work to go into our permanent collection. So that is now with the Washington State Historical Society. For which I'm very grateful, thank you. We are as well. Um, it was, we love having this work in our collection. Uh, so maybe you can talk a little bit about um, creating this work and the inspiration behind it and the themes in this work. Um, so yeah, that, that design in the Coast Salish basket is, is, is known as the star. But it's also known as a house fly too. Don't ask me why, but uh, a house fly pattern. Um, this basket is made you different than how I've made a bunch of the other baskets. I wish. I think this is a shot you guys must have taken, like for uh, catalog purposes. I have another shot of it, but it's great to see it from the inside because it has. Uh, or you know, if you look at it from the top down and just see like one pane of the glass. Uh, it has, it, it uses a, a Venetian cane technique and it really gives it that uh, woven look. And uh, I'm really happy with this this piece. Um, so I'm glad that it, it went to a, a place where again, it, it will be hopefully taken care of for prosperity. Um, again, glass, you know, it, it could could break and it, but will never not be a piece of glass that looks like that. Um, like when I was studying in the Field Museum, they had so many uh, artifacts that were just unaccessible to anybody even really as because of the way they were treated uh, with asbestos uh, that you couldn't, couldn't go see them. And I just like to add this to the long line of, of baskets that, you know, there's such a great history of, of Northwest native baskets and I just am grateful that it can be viewed. I love also that you're mentioning the technique, the specific Venetian technique that gives it the woven look, which is such an interesting idea to take something that was developed, you know, halfway across the world in Italy and then be able to apply it here to replicate something that is a traditional 
you know, traditional weaving, how you would normally see a basket, but applying techniques from far away. Well, if you want me to dork out on glass, I don't know how long this thing runs, but I, uh, you know, what's so cool about glass, there, there's such a, you know, it's dynamic, it's in the moment, it's this process of molten fire and teamwork, but it has an incredible history and well-documented. Um, again, it, it leaves this evidence, there's this end result, which is here, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say just indefinitely, but it, it definitely leaves its mark. It, well, it can be broken. It's there's such a great record of it, and we owe a lot of what we do in the Northwest and the American uh, studio art glass movement to uh, Venice and their innovations for centuries in Venice and then on Murano. Um, it, it's just got such a cool history. Um, you know, if you escaped from from Venice in the in the 1600s and made it to Europe, you were like instantly knighted. I mean, it was the secrets. It was this well coveted like, I mean, there was a time when oil, only royalty drank out from goblets and glass. And, you know, I think what is unique um, to the American studio art glass movement is the designer is the maker. You know, a lot of times these big it takes so much resource and back then like they attribute the whole burning of the black forest and in, in uh europe and germany was to feed the fires and burn and venice they literally you know venice is an island they literally shipped all the wood from from the black forest to keep the fires going in venice um and, and it just has such a yeah it's just it's really cool the history to it um and again, I'm a product of the American studio art class movement. And so that's, that's a unique time where these, uh, these uh, pioneering hippies in college, along with some really scholastic uh, scientific types of um, Harvey Littleton, uh, Leposky, um, there, there's a bunch of them that really helped Fritz Dreisbach that really helped bring it into America. But these guys were just doing it in little garbage can furnaces in the back of the ceramics department. And, uh, you know, fast forward to today, you know, where there's like, you know, there's glass museums around the world and that showcase independent glass artists where the maker is, is also the fabricator slash designer. And uh, I think it really has a cool history that way. It's so fascinating that you're the product of kind of two different schools almost, right? Like you get a lot of your artistic inspiration from family growing around, growing up around artists and kind of having that um, native aspect of artwork, but then also informed by not only, you know, kind of uh, the old world quote unquote glass artists, but then also the glass artists that were here originally. So you you get this beautiful piece from having that knowledge from, you know, your your own personal family, but then also the glass family that you kind of adopted. Yeah, I know I definitely, I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today without help from both sides dramatically and uh you know glass it, i came on glass when i was 20 um and the community that surrounds glass it, again i think it speaks to that teamwork thing and uh you know the pilchuck glass school uh, i mean to not even to sound dramatic but it really like has saved my life in, in many ways i was a was headed on a different path in life when I, I came into glass and is really, you know, that through a patient loving community have, you know, kind of, you know, I found my, my place, uh, again, from both, both sides. I also love that you mentioned that, um, the Royals would be the ones drinking out of this beautiful glassware. And I can't help but think how funny it is that there's this house fly on this basket now thinking about house fly <laughs> in the Royals glassware. But. There's, I'm sure there's a bunch of different names for it. It's a, it's a really common pattern, uh, but you know, that's, 
It's what in the research I've done in the study I've done, I've, heard, I've also heard it called the house fly pattern. And, uh, you know, it's more most commonly known as a star. And I just figured as marketability, this is like my rational side. I'm like, I don't know. Do you, what's the appeal of the fly basket? <laughs> I guess flies are making a lot of headlines these days, though. I was, <laughs> Very thematic, yes. <laughs> yeah. Just on topic, right? So speaking of current times, current events, um, we've all been enduring this global pandemic. How has social distancing and kind of being removed from people changed your artistic practice? My practice, it doesn't have a lot of flexibility as far as there's not a lot of different ways I can do it. We have these, I mean, I, that's not true. We have some processes to, we'll work with face shields like a food service person will do. And uh, a real crafty guy, Fred Metz, has come up with this way to inflate the bubble on the blowpipe with using like a handheld compression bulb like you would do for taking your blood pressure kind of way to inflate, inflate it. But uh, again, uh, the process, a lot of it is the same and that means getting together and working as a team, um, that's loosened up quite a bit. Uh, a studio I primarily make most of my work out of, uh, fortunately has been in Pierce County. The other studio I work at in Seattle is still not opened, uh, Pratt Fine Arts. Uh, the Shack Art Center in Everett is in Pierce County and we've uh, been able to work there at limited capacity. They have, they follow the protocol and you know, there's one team at a time and you've got to clean everything. and again i'm just grateful for that because i guess on a personal level my work um you know as an artist you know you were not saving the world but it, it was really like part of my sanity is being able to create my work and i mean at this adult quasi adult frame of my life uh the people i work with are the people I socialize with because I really don't socialize much and being able to work with these people has given me a degree of normalcy that I just, man, I really would be losing it if I wasn't able to work. Um, and I, my heart really goes out to people that are out there that are, you know, some people have still not left their house and I do not understand, how, you know, hopefully they're doing, you know, they can find some reprieve. Um, yeah, so we've changed the way we're doing things. Um, the glass is still made the same way, but how we approach it is a little different. Um, and again, that you know, it's just kind of the protocols in the shop. Um, and again, the access, there's a lot of places that are just not open. And uh, I mean, finance, I've had, let's, I've had a lot of shows canceled. Uh, Indian market was canceled in Santa Fe. That's usually my, biggest show every year. Um, a lot of native artists uh, rely on that almost solely is there, you know, they'll do two or three of those There's the herd or the, you know, any idle George, any of these other big markets that they go to and they will just make work all year for this one weekend. And, uh, you know, it didn't happen this year. I mean, I went, uh, but it just, it, it was closed, it, it's canceled. And so, um, yeah, I mean, economically, the, what life is looking, every every museum show that I have, aside from my solo museum show next year in June at Pona, if you're listening, uh, has been rescheduled or shuffled around. And uh, uh, some things, they're all trying to happen at the same time next year now. It, when I had the very tightly scheduled for this year, everything is trying to open up at the same time next year. And so I have to cancel a bunch of things. And again, I am fortunate that I, I'm fortunate, but I'm also dependent on my work is how I support myself. Um, I feel like I'm in a good place still, but you know, the, the future is, I mean, I feel like the pandemic will have reaching effects, ripples uh, in the pond, if you will, if, you know, we, we still don't know how things are going to go. I mean, I try not to 
I try and, and stay informed, but I also need to take a step back and just kind of do me too. Absolutely. Well, and you had mentioned earlier, you said you didn't want to exaggerate, but that, you know, working with glass has saved your life. And I feel like artwork right now really is even more important than it has been in the past as people are feeling isolated and just seeing all of the creativity that comes out of artists and being able to connect with people in these unique ways is something that really artists are so good at doing. Um, so I know that I'm really grateful for all of the artwork that's been coming out of this time and kind of like the creativity and how to approach the process and how important it is that you're going to find ways even when you have to work with other people in order to make that work. Well, and as artists, we process a lot of our emotion, like a lot, it's how we process a lot of our things or sometimes we hide from our feelings with, or you, I mean, there's definitely gonna be uh, probably a tremendous amount of work in the aftermath of this. And, uh, you know, I, some of it is how people deal with it. Some of it is how you escape it. Uh, and it, it is a good tool for that. Absolutely. And you had said that um, you mentioned, just like the rest of us, it's hard to kind of navigate following the news and like making sure you're updated, but kind of balancing that with like your experience in the real world. But has your practice been impacted at all by kind of this time of social upheaval with ongoing protests around police brutality and all of these other situations? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think again, it brings up, well, like uh, a lot of the galleries, you know, they have these storefronts and like, and so I've made my career largely as a gallery artist. And that's where they take a, typically a 50% commission and that 50% commission on their end is they pay a really premium uh, rental or real estate space to be located in these really central urban, uh, kind of right in the middle of where these protests are. And, uh, you know, that, and again, what the protests I think are talking about, you know, is, is just this, this, I mean, the injustice of things are these uneven, unevenness of things. And it's, I think there's, I mean, just bringing to light some of what we've all, I mean, my dad personally, my uncle, just the stories that they've had of being, you know, being assaulted by the police is just kind of a normal situation for a native man, you know, and it just falls on deaf ears. And it's not like this just started happening. I think in, if anything, the police departments now are as, uh, integrated racially as any they've ever been. And so you might not see that like, but this is the culmination of just, I mean, how, however long on this continent, you know, and not to mention everywhere. I mean, just throughout time, uh, every man, woman, and child has a video camera in their pocket. And it's like, it won't be ignored anymore that you, it is, it, I mean, this isn't just a fabrication of like, who are you going to believe me, the, the liar in jail or me out here, the upstanding citizen? Um, I don't fall into the camp that all police are bad. I have good police in my family, tribal police. I um, feel like a lot of people get into that for the right reasons. Um, I don't feel like we should be killing each other at war. I feel like Yemen or any of these other places are much, I feel like we're lucky to be here in the streets of America, but there's definitely blood on the streets on that. Uh, and it's, you've got to know your history, you know I mean? And sometimes being honest with yourself is, is the hardest thing. And, you know, you, you definitely uncover a lot of truths. And think that we're kind of living, I mean, we're going to be writing about 2020. I mean, it's like going to be <laughs> your grandkids. So what was that like, you know? And like, well, you know, it was, crazy and we did what we could and we tried to love each other and be compassionate and hopefully we're all on the right side of history um you know and uh try and uh, understand you know i mean just try and empathize with other people because you know it's 
sometimes there's no amount of platitudes that, you know, sometimes the, the words that come out of my mouth, there's nothing that can fix some of the things, you know, it's like intent. Where do we go for? That's what I like. I like, I like proactive, like, what are we going to do? Okay. I, we, we know, you know, like, what are we going to do to make sure that this doesn't happen? You know, how can we like construct, like, how can we be constructive about it? You know, like, reliving ripping the wounds off I, I mean i don't know like i said this is you know largely why i put my phone down because i just you know i really only have so much bandwidth for for this to be honest with you and uh i know that it's out there and so it has affected uh but for me as an artist i'm living in this the fact that the galleries are struggling that's not you know, that's what needs to, I mean, there's a lot of pain and suffering that has kind of come to the surface that I think we all uh, are, are dealing with and, and need to address. It's kind of forcing a little bit of a reckoning or reimagining or rethinking. And um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, are artists going to be engaging with galleries in the same way? Um, how drastically, is art making going to change, you know, between pandemics and social unrest? And so six months in, I feel like we're still kind of staying tuned to see what's going to happen next. We've learned not to say like, how much worse can this get? But <laughs> what well, else are we learning? It's a lot at once. We're, we're talking about a lot of things at once. And it's, it's hard for any one person to take in. I mean, when I saw when we, this question came across the the thing i mean i'm like i don't write out answers i just shoot from the hip because that's how i feel the most honest and genuine and uh kind of am in the moment and there's sometimes there's some ands and ums in the mix but it, you know i'm kind of process it as who i am um but man this is a whole topic of in and of itself you know what i mean like it's a tough question to end on i, I would be honest if i had to like I'm like, well, you know, and here's my uh, career making shiny, pretty luxury items for people's like, you know, not the first level condo, maybe the middle of the condo bill, you know, like that's, uh, I don't know. I'm, I try and add some humor in there too, so that I can digest it. Uh, but yeah, I think that we have a lot of, of things. There's a lot of things on all of our plates. And uh, I'm going to continue to make work because artwork, because that's what I do. And uh, hopefully I can use that to help uh, to help how I can, you know, and I, I started one of the things that got canceled this year that was the biggest for me was uh, this was going to be the third year of the indigenous youth program that I started at the Pilchuck Glass School, where uh, we work with uh, tribal youth. Initially, it was from just the Lummi from my tribe. Uh, Lummi High School and uh, the Lummi Youth Academy. This year we've expanded to uh, a bunch of other, we had kids from the Southwest and we're, we're really open to whoever because it's really tough to try and fill these classes. And it's like, there's 10 available slots and it's like, I'm on the phone, like I'm your cousin, Danny, it's glass, it's cool. Come with me to the woods for a weekend. And you know, <laughs> you'd think it'd be an easy sell, but it's, but we were just kind of getting some steam and and to see that have the brakes kind of put on that really that that was one of the other big bummers um because that's that's how i feel like i'm giving back is like i don't know if my where's my energy best served and it's helping these kids um you know with poverty and injustice is is big you know and it's not just our community i mean it's across the board you know we all we're all suffering and we're all trying to take care of ours. And uh, like I said, hopefully we can find empathy for those out there and uh, have the courage to help those that we can, you know. Absolutely. Um, someone had asked earlier, and I think this is a perfect segue, talking about working with youth, particularly in glass. Do you have any advice for youth that are interested in getting involved in glass as a medium or My how they can Friday. And you just got to get a hold of me and uh, I will advise you to the Pilchuck Glass School where I found out that it's been canceled this spring. So it was canceled this year and we just canceled the spring session 
But next fall, fingers crossed, you can come take a glass blowing class taught by myself and my sister, Ray, at the world famous Pilchuck Glass School and uh, do it. It is no small, I mean, these grants get written and if people don't fill them, they don't continue to hang around. And I was literally like, I mean, it's a great idea, but making one of these things happens, like I literally manifested this last year, like make, like they were gonna not do it, you know, cause we just could not get people to respond. It was not, it's not that there's no interest, but it's like, and I mean, being a glass artist, you may not be a glass artist, but it's a great experience, you know, like uh, just kind of gets you out of your, your reality for a weekend and you just see something new and you may not fall in love with it like I did, but it's something you might not see otherwise. And I want to share it. So. Well, and it's a great opportunity to learn all of those other skills you mentioned before and what you've gotten out of working with glass. It's like learning communication and kind of working with other people and kind of reimagining, like having to think ahead and plan and so well, many skills. If whoever has asked that question is still listening, it's almost a shame I didn't give my well-dialed PowerPoint on this whole topic uh, because it just, it really, you know, there's, there was these two gals that, you know, were, one were, one was in the youth academy. They were from the school. They weren't from the youth academy. And the youth academy is a lot of times like uh, parentless children or, you know, younger youth and, and the high school are just high school students but it, it's really a, it's a different blend. Um, these what two, an incredible experience too. Yeah, these, these two gals in the class are from the same reservation, had gone to the same school and had never spoken to each other because you're from that fucking family and we don't talk to those guys and we don't talk to you guys. And here they are at the glass school and within one weekend, I thought they might've been best friends. And it has, glass has this ability to like, it keeps you in the moment because one, you may get burned, you, uh, it's hot, it's, uh, you need someone's help. You, uh, and I mean, I'm not gonna, it's not a miracle drug. I'm not saying that this is the prescription for every, uh, you know, at troubled youth to, to, to do, but that was when I saw that I was just like, man, this is a powerful thing that I would like to foster. Absolutely. Absolutely. What an incredible experience. I, everyone needs to go check out the Pilchuck Glass School, the youth program, <laughs> sign up, share the word. Yeah, thank you. And speaking of that, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about um, where we can find your work purchase your work, follow you, follow the Pilchuck Glass School. Where can we find you? Well, the all-seeing oracle known as the internet will uh, point you, all you have to do is spell my very simple name, D-A-N, Friday like the day, and the internet will just rat me out and tell you right where I'm at, because um, uh, that's what it does. Um, Damn Friday Instagram is a great way. I feel like the website is the official thing and you can get my backstory and kind of learn a little bit more about me as an artist. My day-to-day -day and my upcoming shows are always on Instagram. I also do Facebook, but Instagram is just so streamlined that it, it makes so much sense. Uh, also the Pilchuck Glass School, you can follow either with a website or a Instagram. Um, Fridayglass.com is the name of my website and that has you know, more detailed information about me in print, but my Instagram story pretty much tells it all too. Well, I know I'll be following along. I love getting those types of things showing up in Instagram. It's kind of like the one happy place left on my phone, you know, that you can pick up and just kind of like, look at all the beautiful things that are going on in the world. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us this evening. This has been such a great conversation. I have to say, I know very little about glass, but getting to talk a little bit more about the process and seeing how you're able to create all of these incredible objects has been amazing. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Molly. I really appreciate it.
Well, and congratulations, especially on the Honoring Innovation Award. I know that we were so thrilled to, to decide that that was the work this year. And we're thrilled to have your work in our permanent collections as well. So congratulations. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank everybody for me, please, at the Washington History Museum. A big shout out. We'll keep making the beautiful work and we will be following. Okay. See ya. <laughs> so again, just a reminder to everybody out there, make sure you see the virtual exhibition. You can find it by going to inthespiritarts.org. There's a little button right in the top right hand side where you can click that says see the exhibition and make sure you go on there and vote for your People's Choice Award. Um, that will be announced next week, October 17th on Saturday. Um, but also go and see all of the incredible vendors that we have for the virtual arts market, our very first one, also at inthespiritarts.org. And you can also see all of the other programming that we've been doing over the last month um, as part of our virtual Northwest Native Festival. And I'd also like to, again, thank our partners, um, Tacoma Art Museum and Museum of Glass for working with us to make this possible, as well as our entire advisory committee and our jurors for making their selections for this year's exhibition and all of the award winners. And again, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors in the Spirit Virtual Arts Market and Northwest Native Festival is generously supported in parts by Arts Fund, Arts Law, the Hub Family Endowment, Mandy's Washington, the Norcliffe Foundation, South Sound Magazine, Tacoma Arts Commission, and Tacoma Creates. And of course, I would definitely like to invite all of you, again, next Saturday, October 17th, is going to be our closing ceremony, which is also virtual, but um, we will be hosting a live performance with Kuhiks. So Dan had mentioned um, Preston Singletary, another glass artist who is actually the bassist and one of the co-founders of that band, will be performing at Museum of Glass, live streamed to you. Um, and we'll also be joined um, by Michael Finley, who is the tribal liaison for the Washington State Historical Society, who will be sharing a little bit about the history of In the Spirit, both the exhibition and the festival. And we'll also be announcing our award winners for People's Choice. So be sure to join us again next Saturday. Um, and you can learn more about all of that at inthespiritarts.org or follow the event on Facebook just to make sure that you're getting all of the updates. Uh, also, we'd encourage you to visit our website, washingtonhistory.org, and also consider becoming a member, making a donation, so that we can continue making all of these programs possible. Um, again, thank you for joining us, and be sure that you online and vote for People's Choice. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye, everyone.